If an alien uh, would have only access to YouTube, he would believe that the world is full of robots. Walking robots, crawling robots, this is supposed to be actually a video, but it doesn't work. Um, you know, all sorts of different robots. In reality, this is not the case. And I would argue that one of the main barriers for uh, robots to become ubiquitous in our life is, is their fundamental lack of autonomy, which, uh, as was pointed out by, uh, you know, in earlier talks, basically drives us to a ratio of roughly one-to-one -one between uh, human and uh, uh, human operator and robot. So I would argue that uh, in order to allow these robots to come out of YouTube, have a positive impact on our life, we need to solve simultaneously three main uh, problem areas, or, or I, uh, as I like to call them, three main miracles. And I like to refer them as mind, smart mind, or smart alg algorithm, algorithm that are able to be run on powerful brain or as a computing substrate that is robust and fast enough to support these complex algorithms, and inexpensive bodies. So let's go and look at each one of these one by one. And the bodies where the uh, best news are, uh, robotic bodies are becoming increasingly uh, flexible uh, and cheap. And this is due uh, to a little bit to everybody of us. So when we buy our uh, third cell phone every year, uh, or our tablet, we are actually pushing down the cost of uh, a ton of sensors that nowadays uh, can be found either in an integral form. So some robots are actually designed to have a cell phone plugged in in them or in components uh, to basically be sensors for robots. And uh, a similar revolution is going on in actuators. This is actually a, a robotic arm uh, made by a student of mine, uh, ex-student of mine, a robot, ba basically made of fabric uh, with inflated air. So bodies are becoming inexpensive, and that's great. Not so much for the mind. The mind or the algorithm uh, are still designed in sort of silos with outcome uh, somehow proportional to each individual companies or each individual's lab uh, R&D. So things that work in silos, we all know they are not very good. And uh, if we, I was trying to look at for an analog of other industries that resemble the robotic industries of today. And uh, the best analogy I have is the internet of the 90s, where everybody was designing their, their own web server. And then it came LAMP, which stands for Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, and PHP, and all of a sudden, a huge standardization of the industry uh, came about, and uh, uh, things, you know, it was much easier to start a web server uh, from the morning to the night. So is there a lamp for robotic mind, the equivalent? And uh, as, again, I'm a neuroscience voodoo guy, and I think that biological brains are the unifying thing. So biological brain combine uh, two very simple ingredients. So they look complex, but in reality, they're simple. They combine huge parallel processing, if we've seen from Joseph how these networks look like, and uh, they couple this with learning. And this is a, uh, an algorithm or a set of ingredients that are consistent across species. So I'm going to zoom through uh, a few applications of these uh, principles to a project that is ongoing. It's a STDR, which is a collaboration between uh, a university and an academic lab, uh, between our lab and a local startup called Neurala in the context of the project for NASA. So NASA tasked us with uh, uh, designing a neuromorphic or a brain-based controller uh, to control robots for uh, planetary exploration with a, with a trick. No GPS and no active sensor allowed. So you can only use passive sensors or sensors that absorb energy. And you, know, you can shoot laser out of uh, the robot to estimate distance or obstacle and so forth. So in order to do this, we refine a model that was initially started with uh, uh, funding from DARPA. So every crazy project starts with DARPA. Mm -hmm. It was the DARPA uh, Synapse project, which uh, I hope I'm not being recorded, but basically it was about building Terminator brain. Sorry. Uh, but you know, a large-scale neuromorphic processor that can run uh, you know, brain, brain uh, uh, algorithms more efficiently on, on hardware that is not necessarily digital or not necessarily compliant with the typical von Neumann uh, architecture. So 32 million neurons, 13 billion synapses. I'm not going to go through each one of them in the next 32 <laughs> million slides. But I'm going to give you a flavor of how these algorithms work. Um, this is the basic task. We have a, a simulated rover. So we took an off-the-shelf uh, game engine and uh, uh, used it for our simulation of a, of a Mars uh, environment. Then it's tasked to go and explore its environment, uh, perceive objects in it, which are uh, most likely rocks of a certain type, mm. at a certain point is going to run out of battery. We'll go back to recharge and we'll go back out to explore again without getting lost. So that's the essential part. It should maintain a sense of position. 
Uh, this is a quick simulation of the, of the model. So the, the rover uh, wanders around this uh, simulated Mars environment. Uh, again, the point is that it, it has to maintain a sense of uh, its location in the environment without getting lost. At a certain point, it will lose power, it will go back to the charging station, and we go back and explore again the environment. So one of the most interesting parts of the model, which is not uh, traditional, uh, one of the least traditional parts is its, its visual system. So, um, and again, we looked at how Mother Nature solves uh, vision rather than uh, going with traditional computer vision algorithms. And the, the, visual, the visual system of, of animals or humans uh, is uh, very uh, strange. So it has a very high resolution in the middle. So if you put your thumb in front of you and try to read something at just a few degrees of your thumb, you will not be able to read it. So the, the fact that you actually see the world with a lot of details is an illusion, which is caused by the fact that you have a very high resolution uh, area that is continuously moved around mm -hmm. at various hertz, you know, three to five hertz, to make sense of the world. And by doing so, the visual system uh, achieves huge computational savings, right? So you don't want a brain that weights more than your body. You want to weight, uh, and the brain already consumes 20% uh, of the power of, of your body. So you don't want huge brains. You want a small brain, and you want clever algorithms. So what the brain does is split the computation between the where and the what system. Where is, where are the stuff in the world, and what is, what are the stuff in the world, you know, simplifying and that moves a space variant sensor around to collect this information and, and uh, piece it together. So this is a slow down simulation of our Mars rover while it looks around at uh, various rocks in its uh, virtual environment. Each one of these dots is a foveation or where the eye lands. And when the rock becomes white, uh, the neuromorphic system says, I, okay, I got it. I know what the rock is. Now I disengage, I go to another rock and I, I continue to sample this environment and uh, uh, classify it. So our VP of uh, business development always tells me to say, we design things for Mars, but we want to bring them down to Earth. So, <laughs> so this is the same algorithm with the same parameters run on an everyday scene, which is a kitchen. So this is uh, uh, not intended for public consumption because you know, it's stuff that models are look at, so it's, it's not easy to read. But these are basically various views of objects in a kitchen uh, that are pieced together uh, to create invariant representation. And again, we have uh, used the Lego Mindstorm, which is a platform that uh, was talked about uh, um, before to run this, uh, this model in, a, in, a, in the real world in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, so minds are becoming smarter and smarter, and uh, I think we are getting a little closer uh, on that side. The brain is the real trick. So brains, biological brains, 100 billion neurons, 250 trillion synapses, they only fit uh, a two liter volume and consume about 20 watts of power. So this is really, really, really tough to match. So just a few years ago, if I would have tried to simulate this thing in a digital computer, in a uh, super, uh, super computer, that would have taken as much room of the, as, the, as, the, as much space as this room, and would have required roughly uh, a nuclear uh, dedicated power plant to power the operations. So the multi-core revolution and the graphic processing revolution uh, has come to the rescue. Uh, again, consumer electronics, even nowadays, have dual core. Soon they will have quad core. They have mobile GPUs for rendering graphics. All these things, if you ask what's, what's for, not to run 500 browser Internet Explorer on your phone, but it's great to simulate neurons. And this is uh, where the roadmap for this processor is going in the next few years. So in the top quadrant, you find the digital processor. So each, each one of us has this, this in their pockets. Um, these are mobile GPUs that are projected to uh, increase the, the green, the green uh, uh, balls here to about 50, uh, 25 gigaflops per watt uh, in, in uh, 2016, and 48 cores, according to, to Intel, of mobile processors in cell phones. The part below is a little weirder. It's non-traditional, I call it fancy. And that's what Joseph was talking about when uh, you know, we simulate neurons uh, by looking at the current itself. So again, huge progress here, but what does it mean? Let's look at the mouse. And believe me, if our robots would be as smart as, as, as a mouse, robots would be really everywhere. So 400 grams of brain, about 70 million neurons, According to this projection, in 2015, we were able to simulate this, this thing in six square centimeter of processor, and which will reduce it to three square centimeters in, uh, in 2018. 
This is not trapped into research labs. So just a few weeks ago, uh, Qualcomm was actually here at the Media Lab presenting their Qualcomm Xerof NPU. What is an NPU? It's neither a CPU nor a GPU. It's a neural processing unit. Neural processing units are, quote, will not only mimic human-like perception, but also have the ability to learn how biological brains do. So we will see, you know, Qualcomm envisioned that this processor will couple, you know, with, with other processors on, on a typical cell board, and their target is actually uh, the, robotic, the robotic industry as a whole. So these things are actually coming out of the lab and starting to uh, impact, uh, hopefully positively, the, ro the robotic industry. So brains are also coming. So just to summarize quickly, uh, we looked at smart minds in expensive bodies and powerful brains. All of them, all these three miracles, starting to get closer to, to realization in the next few years so that we can all look at these graphs uh, and uh, have a little bit more uh, you know, faith that this progression that, that we find in the reports will actually uh, come through in the next few years. And uh, you know, I invite you to actually, if you have the chance this weekend, to go to the Boston Science Museum. Some of the things that I talked about today are launched today, uh, actually, in, a, in, a, in an exhibit, a permanent exhibit at the Boston Science Museum, <coughs> where we are going to have a, a Mars yard, where we are going to display, hopefully successfully, uh, some of this technology. Thank you.